Now I want to introduce our speaker. We're really honored to have Lindsay Darnell Jr. here with us today. Lindsay Jr. was raised in Nebraska. He's one of the well-known deaf advocates here in America. He was part of the efforts of keeping the Nebraska School from the Deaf from closing in 1998. Mr. Darnell also led the students' Silent No More group, the march that took place at Gallaudet University, to protest against the new rules, the new laws that were taking closed captioning off of the televisions. He serves as a Regional Two representative on the board of the National Association of the Deaf. And Mr. Darnell has, do has his own association called Darnell Association that gives various services to deaf people and hearing people alike. He's on the American Sign Language Bible Translation team at Deaf Missions. He teaches theater to deaf children and hearing children at the Rose Theater in Omaha, Nebraska. He's an advisor to the Junior National Association of the Deaf for middle and high school deaf students in Nebraska. And he enjoys politics and history, especially the American Civil War. Thank you, Noah. Thank you for that nice introduction. Well, I've known Noah since he was this little. And he was, it's so good to see him grown into a man and connected to the Bible. Anyway, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank Wheaton for giving me this opportunity to come here and to speak in front of all of you this day. But first, I have a question. What would Jesus do? I mean, that's the title that you often see around town, around places, WWJD. Hmm. That sit situation, the different situations that come up, we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? I mean, that question helps lead us in our life. It's the same intent that God established the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and gave it to Moses. I mean, those Ten Commandments are still applicable today. And often we think to ourselves, Am, what I'm doing, is that okay? And we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and that now saves us, and we're released from the law. But the Ten Commandments are still important because that's how we measure ourselves in our lives. We use the Ten Commandments to lead us in our lives just so we can be good Christians. Okay, so now, suppose you guys are in a situation and you are confronted with a deaf person. What would Jesus do? Think about that. There's a deaf person there. And maybe you've experienced meeting a deaf person. You've maybe met Noah or another deaf person. Did you wonder, geez, how am I going to communicate with this person? What am I going to do? Because I don't want to offend this person. And I mean, did you think, what would Jesus do? Well, before we go ahead thinking about this, what would he do? Don't worry. Because we have scripture in the Bible that tells us that Jesus did already meet a deaf man. And so you can use Jesus and his behavior as your model. Last fall, last October, I attended the Summer Institute of Linguistics Bible Translators in Dallas. All these Bible translators came to this convention. 
And I went there, I stayed there for a week, and there were a whole bunch of different speakers from different places in the world that gathered together there. And they brought their experiences, their consulting experiences, their linguistic experiences, their culture experiences, hearing, deaf. There are a variety of speakers from Southeast Asia, from South America, all different walks of the world. And they brought all of their experiences and explained it. They explained what framework they use, how they face scripture and translate one scripture into their native tongue. They explained the process. There were lots of different speakers and I really enjoyed it because like Noah mentioned, I am a Bible translator myself, English over into American Sign Language. And so I was curious how other translators work. And there was one speaker there that got up and started speaking and told us that today we are actually the second generation of translators. I was so puzzled. Second generation of translators? I didn't know what that meant. So he explained that the first one was Martin Luther from Germany. He wrote and translated scripture for everyday people so that they could understand scripture. And they had different translators working on the Bible, the Hebrew and Greek, translating to various languages so that people could understand. And that was until the 19th century. And those translators are considered the first generation of translators. And we've been so blessed by their work because it helps us in what we're doing today. But their attitude, their approach to linguistics and culture, variety of linguistics and culture are different. They say, this is the word of God and you have to follow this. That's it. And maybe some culture over there and some culture over there and some language over here can't understand it, but they're forced to follow this translation or else they were killed. That's history. Millions and millions of people died unnecessarily in the name of God. That's that group. And today, in the 20th century, we have a new trend. Christians going into different cultures and different languages and learning their culture and learning about how they live and learning about their languages and learning all they can before they preach the Word of God. That's their philosophy. And that, they believe, will bring more people to God. So these translators that have been working all along have a different approach. They study their culture, they study their language, they study the history of the people group, and then when it's time, they sit down with them and they work translating. And there was one story, the speaker said, that there is this group in Africa. And he said that when they were translating it, one word came up, angel. God's messenger, angel. So the translator was working with this cultural group in this country, with their language and their culture, sat down with them and was working with them, and they said, angel. And they tried to explain the concept to them and said, do you understand? They said, yes, our word for that is this. And they spelled out this word. And if you literally translate the word into angel, it means witch. <laughs> and so they were like, oh, no, 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 that's not what I mean. No, I don't mean witch. They said, no, I understand, but if you put that word in the whole context of what you're trying to say, we'll know that it means angel, but the word means witch. And they were like, okay. So, see, that's the point. The point was they respected this cultural group and their language, and they were careful with it. 
And so now I want to go to the Bible when Jesus meets this deaf man, okay? It's in Mark chapter 7, verses 32 to 35. And I want to go through four different verses, and I want to explain them as a deaf man, okay? I look at this as, from a deaf perspective, and that's what I want to explain, all right? Verse, chapter 7, verse 32. It says, There's some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. All right. To see the man, see that word hardly talk? There's another version. It means heavy tongue. When I look at that, that tells me that that man had some experience speaking at one point in his life. Maybe when he was young and then later became deaf because my parents are deaf and my brother is deaf and I grew up deaf. I've been signing ASL in my house my whole life. But when I went to school, I received speech training. So it happened today, if I started talking, you would hear me and I would sound like I had a heavy tongue. So the point is, is this man had language in his brain. In his mind, he had language. He was deaf, but he had difficulty speaking. All right, next. Verse... 33. Now Jesus took him aside, away from the crowd. Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Now that verse right there tells me that Jesus looked at this man, knew he was deaf, and Jesus knew how to communicate with him. And if you remember, they mentioned that several other times. That Abraham, in the beginning of time, that Jesus was God, and that God made deaf people and so Jesus himself made deaf people. So when Jesus came upon this deaf man and looked at him, Jesus knew who he was. He knew how to communicate with him. And what did Jesus do? He sees this deaf man, and he knows he's not dumb. He knows he's gone through this experience. And he knows that this deaf man's wondering what's going on, what's Jesus going to do. Hey, yesterday, my plane was delayed, and I had to switch planes, but you know what happened to me? The woman came up to me and didn't explain it to me. She didn't write on the note about what was going on. She just wrote on a piece of paper and said, follow this man. Follow this man. I was supposed to go on American Airlines, and so I didn't know what I was doing, and I followed this man to United Airline, Airlines and found out it was delayed. And I was so disgusted because... All she had to do was tell me what was happening. But Jesus did tell this deaf man what was happening. He touches his ears, he spits, touches his mouth, and so he's telling him, I'm going to do something to you. Now, verse 34. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be open in Greek. Okay, so deep sigh. Look at that deep sigh or groan in some translations says groan. I remember when I was young, when I was a little boy at the Nebraska School for the Deaf, all of us boys would play around and be goofy and we'd go to the shower, into the stall, and there was this 
this acoustic sound in the shower stall. And you go into the corners and we go really low with the bass deep voice and we go, oh, really low. And you could feel all this vibrations coming off the walls of the stall. We thought it was so cool because we could feel it. And so when that man came to Jesus, he had this deep groan and he could feel it. That deaf man could feel it. And he realized, wow, something is happening. The point is that he believed and he grabbed the opportunity and Jesus said, Ephatha, and his ears were open. Okay, that's that. And now in that scripture, it can also be dangerous as well as beautiful because all along, like you've seen this morning, one to two percent of deaf people worldwide have accepted Christ as their savior. The rest haven't. Because you know what? I've met so many deaf people and asked why they haven't accepted Jesus. They say, Jesus, nah. Jesus doesn't like deaf people. Jesus healed the deaf man. See, that's so dangerous. That's the wrong idea, interpretation of the scripture. If we could look at scripture and explain that Jesus didn't do that for the purpose of just healing him because he needed to be healed, he was showing God's power, his glory. Jesus did so many miracles and healed the blind and healed the crippled and healed the lame and he healed a deaf man. And the whole crux of that is to show God, I am. And if you believe in me, you're gonna have eternal life in heaven. That's the point of all of this. And so now all of you today, when you meet deaf people in the back of your mind, be thinking in context, in whole, for the glory of God, not because the deaf person needs help, so I'm gonna help them, no. Explain the glory of God with respect and consideration of his culture and his language. There's so many deaf people that think they're supposed to be eradicated, and they're not. Over and over again, that's all they hear, that deafness needs to be eradicated. You need to say, I respect you, I understand you. You're okay, and God understands that too, and show how Jesus met a deaf man, not the point of healing him, but to reveal God's glory and to bring deaf people to God. It's the same with hearing people. There's so many hearing people who are not connected to God. So we really have a lot of work to do for hearing and deaf people both. One final verse that I want to read, I'm a strong believer in this, is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's what I believe. That's what I, I believe that deaf people need to do. Deaf people need to come together, connect together, and call God, and God will heal the land. Just like with all cultural groups. And if we all work together as Americans should be doing, we are gonna see so many blessings in our lives and throughout eternity. Thank you.